And would like to personally welcome you all to Houston and this uh, very exciting program that we have today. Our keynote lecturer is uh, Professor Peter Capitin. He needs very little introduction to, for most of you probably. He's a professor of cardiothoracic surgery and epidemiology who practiced at uh, the Rotterdam, um, Netherlands, um, at the Erasmus University. He is um, very well known in the field, as most of you probably know, for his contributions in transcatheter therapeutics as a PI of Excel syntax the Euro uh, version of partner trials and many other landmark trials that have really revolutionized um, transcatheter therapeutics, especially for cardiothoracic surgeons. So um, I'd like to welcome him as he gives us a talk. Um, he joined most recently Medtronic as a CMO, the chief medical officer and the vice president. And I'm very much looking forward to his perspective on how industry and surgeons can collaborate uh, to create new frontier in transcatheter therapeutics. So Peter, thank you very much. Thanks very much for the invitation, and thanks, for Maurice, for the introduction. And it's great that Maurice has now found a place here in Houston. I think you have a great advantage of having recruiting uh, such a wonderful person. I got to know Maurice through CTSnet and the STS, and also the ESCTS, European Association for Cardiac Surgery. So as um, Maurice already alluded to, uh, I, uh, I joined what sometimes is called the dark side of medicine. Is uh, I went to, uh, to the industry. I, I worked for a long time in Rotterdam, the Erasmus Medical Center. Um, I had my PhD students there. I still have them. I still have my appointment there. But there was this opportunity to join the industry. It took a long time, about nine months, to make up my mind whether I want this job or not. And I spoke with a lot of people. And actually, I realized also that you know all the innovation that take place uh, in, in devices are actually driven by, by industry. Uh, there's a lot of engineers behind the technology. And if you want to play a role there, if you want to make a big difference for uh, many people, um, that is a great opportunity to, uh, to learn how that works. And that's why I took that decision. On the other hand, you know, physicians are very important to apply those techniques into the clinical practice. And physicians can, up, can come up with new ideas and new patient population where they can use those new techniques and those devices. So you really need both of them. Uh, but at the same time, I realized, you know, that actually there's, there's this still this distinction between the industry and, and surgeons, also cardiologists, but you have to work together. And, and that's why I thought it would be a good opportunity. And also great that he asked the surgeon to join in this era where transcatheter heart valve, everybody's discussing, and that takes off and is, is introduced in so many hospitals nowadays. So how, why is it so important that surgeons play this role? So just to point a little bit to the fact that I'm just one of those 85,000 employees that Medtronic has. Uh, there's a lot of money put into research and development, and that's, a, of course, very important for, uh, for an industry to, uh, to be on the leader position in the market. One thing that I also realized is actually what I didn't know as a physician, I thought if you have something with a product that goes wrong, I would never set hardly ever send it to, back to the industry. I always thought, you know, they don't want to hear about complaints. Well, it's the opposite. I also deal with medical affairs which, and medical complaints. So if there's something going wrong with a product, I cannot tell you how many people really dive, take a deep dive into the issue. They really spent hours and hours, days and days, to try to understand what went wrong. Was it something that on the product side or was it something on the way the product was handled? But before they take that decision and before they, they really uh, spend many hours with engineers, with the people that produced the, the, the product, to try to find out, did something go wrong on the side of the manufacturer? And now I realize how important that is, that you get as many complaints as possible, because that's the only way how you can improve it. So if you want to be a market leader, if you want to have that position, you actually want to know what goes right, but also what goes wrong, to try to improve it. So that's a lot of employees are dealing with just about complaint handling and to try to find out. So one thing that I also realize is that engineers think differently about complications than we do as doctors. We think at the end of the year, well, maybe we had a little more, bit more bleeding events this year. We had a little bit more rethorchotomies. They come to me and say, well, you know, we had an incident of 0.002% of this complication, and now it went up to 0.0025%. Is this an issue? And then they could really look into, did something change in our way we manufacture our products? And so really the, the small signals that may point to something that has changed already, uh, they, they pay attention to. 
So I think, you know, as doctors, we can learn from this, how, how we would look at our complication rate. But also, uh, I think it's important what I tell the people now with Medtronic, you should really lecture people about this issue and that you really want to hear if something goes wrong with the product. So if a patient gets an endocarditis, if the patient gets a bleeding event, if the patient has to be reoperated for valve failure, that's something actually we as doctors should report to them because that's the only way to improve it. So there's cardio, cardiac and vascular, there's diabetes, restorative therapies group, and minimally invasive. And cardiac and vascular is, of course, how the, the company started. But of course, diabetes is, a, is really a very prevalent disease, so that group has grown as well. But cardiac and vascular is still very important. Aortic and peripheral vascular, cardiac rhythm and heart failure, and coronary and structural heart, and that's the part that I'm now involved in. So what is Tavern the history and how the market has grown, and why, how surgeons play an important role here? Well, if you look at the history of, of surgery, it started already of, in the 19th century, where the first uh, step wound to the heart was closed by a, a, Dutch, uh, a, a German surgeon. And, uh, but then in 1923, the first valvulotomy. Then we had congenital hypothermia, where we put the patient in the bath and tried to cool them down to do an, an, a valve procedure. The first prosthetic heart valve in the descending order. And then the invention of the heart-lung machine in 1953. So now if you look at the first aortic and mitral valve replacement already took place in 1960. So there's a long history, and that's what I also tell the people now within the company, saying, you know, listen to the surgeon, because they have a long history, and they know all the complications that can occur also with new products that you put on the market. The first home graft implantation, 1962. 1965, Carpentier with the first mercurial, result, uh, mercurial salt preserved xenograft, which didn't last very long. It had an early failure rate. Hancock, the first commercially xenograft valve, and still the Hancock valve is produced, and it's still popular because the price is relatively low. So these are all the, the heart valves that were put on the market, and you will recognize some of them that were also withdrawn from the market because there was early failure rates. So we have a long history, and that's why we have play an important role here. Now then you look at the last couple of years by leaving the heart valves, but then the first transcatheter heart valve was put on the market in 2002, by Carpentier, uh, by, by Cribier. First transapical heart valve in 2006, the valve and valve procedures, and now we're working with the mitral valve space, the entrapment device. So if you see now between the first, let's say, open heart surgery and now the, uh, the transcatheter heart valve, the period has become much shorter. So of course, everything has become much faster, technology improvement has become much easier to do, uh, and all, uh, everything, all the developments go much faster. But still you need the clinical involvement because you, you want to know, does it really work in patients? Does it really, uh, uh, can be implanted? And can it be handled by a surgeon or interventional cardiologist? So if you now look at the TAVR history, of course, again here from 2000 until 2015, you see it, all the different trials that have been performed, all the iterations of the transcatheter devices, it has gone much and much faster. Now, some people say, well, you don't need a surgeon to be involved. A surgeon is too good to play with wires. And I have a colleague and a good friend in the Netherlands who will say, you know, I learned to do surgery, and I'm good at that. So if we come up with a new therapy for uh, lung cancer, and radiotherapy might prove to be better than open surgery, I'm not the one who's going to do radiotherapy. I will still focus on thoracotomies and getting out the, the, the tumor with, with my knife. So he said, I was trained to do, is that true or not? And that's, of course, the discussion, how should surgeons be involved? I think, personally, if you want to drive innovation, you will have to work together. You have to work with the expertise from interventional cardiologists and surgeons together. So maybe the procedure can be done by one or the other. Of course, that can be done. But if you really want to drive innovation, and again, with mitral, it's important as well, and I will come back to that later, is that you have to have surgeons involved. If you want to do a transapical procedure, surgeon has to play an important role there. If you want to understand the mitral valve disease, surgeons still play an important role also to teach to our colleagues in cardiology. One other thing, of course, is what we have also, I think, has driven is the fact is the iteration of valve so here you see the first core valves, Evolute R and Evolute Pro. And as surgeons, we showed them, you, you, don't, should, you should not expect paravalvin, except paravalvin leakage. Pacemaker rates should go down to the rate that surgeons are used to. So if you want to drive innovation, you have to get a high standard. And then you try to get the new product as good as the gold standard, which is currently surgical AVR. And of course, in high-risk patients, you may trade off a less invasive approach 
by getting some of the complications, but if you move to low risk patients, you get you have to hold yourself to the same standards as with open surgery, which is a pacemaker rate of two to three percent, which is parallel of leakage actually almost non-existing, and a valve durability that has been proven to be about 10, 15 years. Um, and, and so that, that's the golden standard, especially in low risk patients. One other thing that I think we have to drive as well is that and you see here the Horizon platform that is currently in development. We have to say, well, you know, coronary access is important. If you go to low risk patients, you know, you, you must ensure coronary access. As surgeons, we know that often during our surgical AVR, we have to do a coronary bypass operation. Coronary sclerosis and, and sclerosis of the, of the aortic valve is a type of similar disease. So most 40% of patients that undergo surgical AVR also undergo coronary bypass surgery. So we also have to drive and say, you know, in the future, you will need coronary access because lots of our patients will need coronary uh, um, um, PCI, for example. So the other thing is that, of course, at the same time, you also want to drive innovation in surgery, in surgical devices. And, and so therefore, the Evadis valve was put on the market now. It has FDA approval, uh, a CE mark, and, and also approval in Japan and South America. Is that you want to be prepared for future, future valve and valve. So improve radio opacity, Improve sizers and technique, sewing sizing, so the sewing ring is much easier to use. You don't want any paravalve leakage, but also you want to prove that actually this valve lasts very long so that you can, maybe you can use this bioprosthetic heart valve in younger patients and then later on you can drive, you can use a valve and valve procedure to really get them to the, uh, uh, for a lifelong uh, experience. So the market has grown very fast. We have shown this, Tom already showed this beautifully with the slides of how many centers now you have in the US. But of course, there are other, centers, other places in the world that may also need um, transcatheter valve replacement. Africa, you see that is dark blue because there's not much surgical activity in Africa yet. And might be that they skipped the landlines for, for telephone communication. They immediately went to uh, mobile phone. It might also be that they skip you know, open heart surgery and move towards transcatheter aortic valve replacement. You don't need a heart lung machine. You don't need an intensive carriage with open heart surgery. But again, there, of course, surgeons has to play a role there as well to drive this because currently surgeons are going to those countries to really help them to also to get st starting with cardiac surgical programs. And maybe we can also bring this new technology to them um, in, in the elderly patient population. So the market modeling is, is also important. So what you have seen that penetration of coronary stents is, is up to 90%. Pacemakers as well, ICDs. But surgical AVR is not as, as, as penetrated as all the other ones. So there's still a large patient population out there that are currently not treated. Not treated with TAVR and not treated with surgical AVR. There will still be a lot of patients, especially the elderly patient population, that don't get treated, that have stenosis, are sitting, for example, in a nursery home, cannot do much anymore, and they could be helped by either surgical AVR or transcatheter AVR. Again, atrial fibrillation is about the same, that a lot of patients with atrial fib are currently not treated. So despite the fact that we're in the Western world, we have those techniques available, we see that many patients are not treated. And this actually is a, a, a study that we just published from, uh, with my group in Rotterdam. We published this in the European Heart Journal, is if you assume that high-risk patient and intermediate-risk patient can be treated with transcatheter aortic valves. How many patients will be out there? So if you take a closer look, for example, this is my own country, the Netherlands, a small country, but we estimate that for intermediate and high-risk, there might be 3,600 patients that can be treated with transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Currently, we only treat about 1,800 patients. So there might be two times as many patients as we're currently treating. Um, and it might be because those are not referred by a general practitioner. And I have a good friend of mine from high school, he became a general practitioner, and he's up to date. He goes to courses, etc. And he was there with Christmas, we had dinner with him, and I asked him, have you heard about TAVR? And he told me, well, I think I have a patient with a TAVR. And the patient had to explain to him what a TAVR is. We live with aortic stenosis every day. We know what TAVR is. But a general practitioner sees one patient, one new patient with aortic stenosis every six years. So for them to have a patient and to refer them to a TAVR treatment is quite exceptional. So Germany, you know, about potentially more than, uh, more than 20,000 patients. Currently, they're treating about 12,000 patients per year. France, about similar. They treat about 8,000 per year. There are potentially 14,000 patients there. Uh, 
In the USA, potentially there are more than 50,000 patients that can be treated yearly with transcatheter aortic valve if you just take into account intermediate and high risk patients. So there will be lots of more penetration in, uh, with TAVR in the coming years. And at the same time, what you have seen is that the surgical AVR referral has also been increased. But what we have seen in the Netherlands, and it might be similar in the United States, that you see more patients who are more complex. They have not only aortic stenosis, they also have complex coronary disease. They have triple or double valve replacement that they need. They have endocarditis. So how to train the future cardiac surgeons for those complex procedures, the easy, single, uh, isolated aortic valve replacement will be taken over by transcatheter aortic valves. What is resting for, rest for the surgeons are the more complex cases. So that's something we have to face for the future and how to train people for those complex cases. At the same time, you also see where surgeons are important is to drive those uh, trials. Lots of trials have been taking place in, in the entire world and more than we have ever seen in the surgical AVR. But lots of them are also comparing surgery versus transcatheter aortic valve. And those trials can only take place if surgeons play an active role there. The same will happen now in the transcatheter mitral world. At the same time, we have to think, do we need more trials in the future? If you see now here core valve TVT registry results compared to the, the TAVA results, the, 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 the trial results, they are actually quite similar. They're not very different between the two. So we have to think also about new ways, Bayesian analysis and new ways to do trials. So these are dollars. And I always say without within Matonic, don't show dollars to physicians. They don't like to talk about dollars. We, we, talk, we think about number of patients. At the same time, this is what analysts predict is that if they talk about dollars, this is how the market will grow. And analysts are very interested in this because they want to buy stocks at the market, etc. So this is their estimate is how the market will grow. I think what is important, what we as physicians can learn from this is that we have to be prepared for the future. We have to have more interventional cardiology labs, more uh, uh, hybrid ORs, and at the same time, we also have to think about how will surgical AVR and, and the surgical market change. So again, here you see that this is how the history, and actually it was quite good estimate how the market will grow, and it will grow forward to 2026. So there will still be growth up in the coming years. So what is the next frontier? That is mitral. And mitral, of course, is much more complex than simple aortic stenosis. And again here, surgeons have to play an active role. Because a surgeon, we understand the type of disease, we understand also the type of patients. Functional MR patients are very different from DMR patients. And also how to address those patients after the, uh, the, uh, the, the procedure. Again here, they predict a huge market increase. Uh, again here, unfortunately in dollars, but of course it translates into patients as well. It might be in the near term. You have mitoclip here, the near, near term. In the future, to, you know, we may, may need maybe uh, neocords, uh, neocorde uh, trans, transapically, TMVR replacement, maybe a transcatheter ring, and etc. And in the future, maybe everything might be replaced with a perfect uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement solution. Uh, lots of things are out there. There are some of them are already commercially, and some of them are uh, are not commercially. This is the Entrapa device, the the trial that has started here in the U.S. with this device. You see an inner ring with the valve in it and an outer ring that conforms to the mitral annulus, which is of course D-shaped and not completely circular. And hopefully by this outer ring, we can confirm that the inner ring is not squeezed and that the valve leaflet will stay intact. It's, it's large, it's huge. So currently it can only be delivered transapically. But last week I've also uh, worked in the lab in, in, uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis, and we also delivered one in the cadaver transfemorally. 43 French is the delivery system, so that is huge. Of course, you go to the transfemoral vein, but currently we still have to explore whether you know you can really stretch the vein to that size of 43 French. It's it's big, I can tell you. We managed it, and this is how its system looks like. I, look, uh, I showed you in a glass model, which has a 43 French uh, in a diameter, and you see that the, the system transfers to the septum. This is the the mitral valve, is the red ring there on the uh, on, on 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 this side here. And you, of course, you have to, as with the mitral clip, you have to position it uh, exactly in the right uh, spot uh, above the mitral valve that you get, get it centrally. Again, if you go in with this huge device and you would touch one of the leaflets, you would immediately create massive insufficiency. So therefore, it is very important that you will stay centrally when you advance the device into the left ventricle. So you advance the device, the capsule comes out, 
and it works exactly the same valve is used for transapical as for transeptal, you push the capsule uh, forward and you release the valve into the mitral annulus. And, and once, of course, you have deployed it into mitral annulus, then you have to get the whole system out again. You have to, uh, and which is also not that easy because you have to make the same maneuvers to get through the septum. As you will appreciate, there will be a big hole in the septum and you need to close it as well. With a 43 French device, of course, there will be a, a hole that, that needs closure. So after the deployment, you also need to close it with, for example, an m device. So there are more people uh, looking at this solution. At least 33 TMVR devices are currently in development. So there will be lots of devices coming out in the coming years. And they can only succeed if surgeons play a role in those devices. Something else, this is my last slide, is what will change as well. I think as physicians, we also should play the role and try to select the devices. Everybody's talking about value-based healthcare. And value-based healthcare is something, you know, that is current, there, there are multiple definitions for it. A lot of people see it as, and also companies see it as a, something that you, you will guarantee a certain outcome. And if you don't get that outcome, somebody else has to pay for it and not the patient. And, and, and you can also say, well, the company has to pay for it. Your device fails, the company has to pay for it. Physicians become more and more employees of large medical groups, hospitals. You see that already in Germany, lots of consortia of hospitals, and they are driven by managers, and the doctors play a less important role. Which also may mean that we may play a less important role in selecting the device that maybe benefit our patients. And I think we have to be very careful about this, and we have to play an important role. So not only should you play a role in, this, in the, the driving innovation, I think as surgeons and physicians, we should also play a role in selecting and in, in the management positions in hospitals. We have to have, uh, have our voice there as well. So I think also that in the future, preferred product will be a combination of devices and services. This is not only focusing on, on a device, but how can you diagnose a disease better, easier at a certain time point where the patient still has a good ventricle and also play a role in after the, the patient has been dismissed from the hospital. So thank you very much for your attention and it was a great honor to be here and to uh, thank you for the organization for inviting me. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Peter, for an excellent talk and a really nice perspective. Uh, for someone like you who's really been on both sides, the academic side, and now has moved to industry, has worked as a clinician, as an epidemiologist, it's really wonderful to see that blending together. Um, we have maybe five minutes for questions. If anyone from the audience had a burning question to address to Professor Capitin. Yes, please, Dr. Damiano. Peter, great talk, and I think we're all excited to have you as the CEO of Medtronic. I was wondering if you could look at it. You know, I remember in 2007, um, Edwards came up to us and said, "Could you predict what you think in, um, you know, six, seven years?" What the number of TAVRs were going to be, and we we thought we were being pretty generous, but we probably underpredicted what the field has done. Yeah. You know, I agree with you. Mitral's a much bigger challenge, but I wonder if I could put you on the spot. If we look in five years, for instance, where do you think? Transcatheter mitral therapeutics will be compared to open surgery, uh, both repair and replacement. You think it's going to be slower or quicker? And do you think we're going to get to the point, uh, which is fairly rapidly, I think, where more TAVRs are being done than surgical valves, certainly in the Western world? I wonder if you no, could talk about what do you think the progress in the mitral space? Yeah, absolutely. No, very relevant, of course, point uh, that you make is that. TAVR went actually much quicker than I think we as surgeons predicted because, you know, we said, you know, you will get emboli to your brain, you will get a higher stroke rate, more pacemakers, paravalve leakage. This is impossible. So we were, uh, at least I was wrong. <laughs> I didn't believe it at that time. So it might be, this is similar with TMVR. Well, it might be similar, uh, but of course we all know that the disease is more complex. I think one factor that will be important is the co-op trial. If the co-op trial shows to be positive so that you can treat functional MR with a clip, and that, that really uh, will improve patients' outcome in terms of less hospitalization, less heart failure hospitalization mainly, um, and, and maybe 
prolonged life expectancy and, and uh, better quality of life. That will be very important also to drive, because I think TMVR will first focus on patients with functional MR, bad ventricles, comorbidities, so the high-risk patient population. And if co-op will be negative, if we don't show a benefit from, from treating patients less invasive and with any device, that also will slow down, I think, the enthusiasm about uh, uh, any type of, of transcatheter mitral solution. At the same time, what you show also with these graphics is that what we don't show is the confidence limits, and they are wide. And they're much wider with TMVR, I think, than with the aortic valve replacement. So there might be, a, we might be very optimistic or very pessimistic, uh, something we don't show in those slides, uh, which I point to also with uh, at Medtronic, so you have to have show those, these as well. Uh, because it might be that there will be less patients that refer to this type of treatment. Mitral is, is much more complex, so I think, you know, we haven't figured it out. So the TMVR, the entrapment device, is big, it's huge. And it has to come down in size. You will get more patients with left ventricular alpha tract obstruction that you cannot treat. There will be patients uh, where you don't fit the 43 French device. So it has to come down in size, it has to come down in the delivery system, it has to become better. As long as it's transapical, there will be lots of patients that will be excluded from it. So it all depends a little bit of how fast that innovation will, will go. And so if, if I have the, I cannot make the, 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 the prediction very accurately, I think it will grow in the, the, the coming years. The high-risk patient will be treated with, with those devices, but it will be slower than with uh, aortic. But there might be also a lot of patients out there that we as surgeons don't see currently. Yeah. Peter has to catch a flight, so I think we'll let him run. And thank you very much again. I really Thanks. appreciate it. And thank you for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you.